here. Thank you very much, Luigi. Well, good morning to the members, uh, Ms. Rahman, Mr. Bloomfield, as well as Mr. Bustaino. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez, know that you are missed. Uh, we hope uh, all is well. So I want to thank all my colleagues for being here this morning. Uh, before we begin taking public comment, I want to go over uh, what our plans are for the items that are before us here today. Uh, we will be having presentations on items one, three, and four uh, this morning. Uh, for item two, I recommend we move it on consent and support the recommendation in the Propositions HHH, Administrative Oversight Committee's report. Uh, with that being said, let's get to uh, open up our lines for public comments. Uh, we have Gita uh, from the City Attorney's Office with us today. Gita, if you could be so kind enough to uh, prepare everyone uh, as they call in. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To the members of the public calling in, when it's your turn to speak, please state your name and which of the agenda items you would like to speak on. You will have one minute to speak on one agenda item or two minutes to speak on two or more items. In addition, those who would like to address the committee with general public comment will be provided one additional minute for a maximum of up to three minutes per person for all agenda items, including general public comment. We will inform you when your time is up. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you are speaking on an agenda item, you will get one brief warning from the chair. If you do not immediately get clearly back on topic, or if you again stray off topic, you will forfeit the rest of your time and we will move on to the next speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe you're on mute, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Gita. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, and uh, Mr. Uh, Verano, Luigi, if you could be so kind enough also to prepare the folks. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 160-453-9676 and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 to request to speak. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Luigi. I think we're ready. I think staff is ready, so we can have the speakers call in. Uh, please state your name. Uh, as well as I didn't you'd like to speak on. Uh, let's move forward. Caller on number ending in 3600. Please press star six to unmute. Good morning, Welsh. Item four and general public comment. Please state your name on the items on which you'd like to speak. Melanie Welsh, I'm speaking on item four and general public comment. Okay, you have two minutes. My name is Melanie Welsh and I'm the principal at Receded Charter High School, a 6 through 12 span school in Council District 4. I'm calling to support the amendment to the Los Angeles Municipal Court section 56.11 and 41.18. Eight, which would expand to include all schools and daycare centers in the city. This amendment would ensure that students and staff feel safer on their daily route to school. We appreciate all of the efforts the city has taken to provide outreach services and housing to individuals and families who find themselves unsheltered. However, these continued issues have created an urgency to ensure families are safe when entering our campuses. Since the reopening of LAUSD schools this fall, principals and staff have continued to work hard to ensure schools are welcoming environments for our families and surrounding community. However, in over 100, 100 schools throughout the district, the unhoused have provided challenges for school communities, including parents, students, and staff. Schools and our families have had to deal with illegal dumping of garbage and debris, unclothed individuals, solicitation, and unsanitary sidewalks. These conditions are a public health hazard, unsafe, and traumatic for our students. In my school, we see the Charter High School students and the staff have had to deal with the following. Unhoused individuals camping at the school entrance and in the bushes within arm's length of the sidewalk, where our children walk to the neighbor, uh, neighboring elementary school, um, urinating in front of the children. Unhoused individuals threatening staff and students at school dismissal time with a baseball bat permitting us from opening our gates on time to dismiss students. 
tents with unhoused individuals with garbage and unsanitary conditions within 30 feet of classrooms of some of our most fragile students with disabilities. And finally, students and parents wondering if it's safe for their child to walk one block to the neighboring middle school, high school, or two blocks to the elementary school. Thank you, caller. Your time's up. Caller with the number ending is 3909. Please press star 6 to unmute. 3909. One more time. Caller with the number ending in 3909. Please press star 6 to unmute. There you go. Hi, uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, please state your name and Thank you. Would you like to speak, please? Thank you. My, my name is Eric Ades, and I would like to speak on item number four and general public comments. Great. Um, good morning. Good morning, Council members. My name is Eric Ades, and I'm the Senior Manager for Strategy and Systems Change with the United Way of Greater LA. I'm calling today on behalf of United Way to oppose item number four, the proposed ordinance prohibiting sitting, sleeping, lying, and storage of property within 500 feet of schools or daycare centers. Um, in the city, there are over 1,000 LASD sites, over 600 private schools, countless daycare centers. Enforcement of a law like this will not end homelessness, but it will result in displacement of tents and encampments to other areas deeper into the communities where these locations exist. And as that happens, re-traumatization, re dispossessions of the only possessions unhoused people have, and disconnection from services that can actually rehouse these individuals. There are so many questions that yet to be considered relative to this motion, many of which were raised by you all when this change was announced surprisingly on the floor a few weeks ago. Does there need to be signage? How much will that cost? How many sites does this actually implicate? How can we ensure outreach engagement is occurring? Given the potentially massive impact this change would have on limited resources, at the very least, this should be vetted thoroughly before moving for a vinyl vote. And to be clear, this is not about supporting or endorsing the presence of tents and encampments near LASD sites. I am the parent of an elementary school student, and nothing is more important to me than the safety of my daughter. And there are unhoused people living near her school. But this is about the policies we choose to put in place to ensure that people aren't pushed into tents near these schools and what it will take to rehouse these same individuals. Additionally, this motion is moving forward while there is another motion essentially banning homelessness 500 feet from libraries, one of the only, one of the only and most important indoor places where unhoused individuals can exist and be. And two days ago, council passed an ordinance clearly targeted at punishing unhoused people for repairing, selling, and basically having a bike in public. In public. Council members, this is a step backwards. This will not lead to more unhoused people being rehoused. This will further entrench in and communities, and we can balance the safety of our schools and the safety of our families. Thank you, Speaker. Caller with the number ending in 0984, please press star 6 to unmute. Great. Please state your name and the items on which you'd like to speak, caller. Colleen Padger, item four, no public comment. Okay, you have two minutes. Good morning, Chair DeLeon and members of the committee. My name is Colleen Padger. I am the coordinator of legislative advocacy for the Los Angeles Unified School District. We are pleased to support item four, which will amend municipal code 4118. Los Angeles Unified is committed to providing all children a safe route to and from school. One of the priorities within the district's newly released strategic plan is to design and sustain welcoming, safe, environmentally friendly, affirming, and inclusive learning environments. This includes ensuring a safe passage for all our students. However, during this past 2021-2022 school year, there have been over 100 schools impacted by nearby homeless encampments. These local issues impact the daily operation of our schools as we are required to reach out to city agencies for help addressing situations including the illegal dumping of garbage and debris, unclothed individuals, fires, solicitation, school break-ins and vandalism, and unsanitary sidewalks. These conditions are a public health hazard, unsafe, and traumatic for our students, family, and staff as they enter campuses in the morning and are dismissed in the evening. We appreciate all the efforts that the city has taken to provide outreach services and housing to individuals and families who find themselves unsheltered. We recognize housing insecurity is a major challenge for the residents of Los Angeles and that there is much more work to be done to provide housing programs and services to our most vulnerable residents. However, these continued issues surrounding our schools have created an urgency to ensure students, 
their families, and our school staff are safe when entering and exiting our campuses. Therefore, on behalf of the Los Angeles Unified School District, we strongly support an amendment to Municipal Code 4118 to prohibit encampments within 500 feet of all schools. Thank you. with the number ending in 3784. Great. Please state your name and the items on which you'd like to speak, please. Yeah, you're unmuted. Good job. Hi, my name is Andrew Greitner. I'd like to speak on item number four and general public comment. Great, you have two minutes. All right, I'd like to um, call to oppose the amendment to 41... Point eighteen, the that um that prohibit that would prohibit encampments near schools. We this whole um, municipal code is very cruel, and it's not actually helping to solve the issue of homelessness or or help our unhoused neighbors actually get housing or anything. Basically, all this does, all this is going to do, is it's going to and the police and other sanitation workers and such out, and they're just going to, um, you know, criminalize, just ticket unhoused people. They're just going to, you know, all they're going to do is they're just going to move them over to the next block over or whatever, rather than, you know, actually provide them with housing or services or anything. I mean, the, the people being un we shouldn't have situations where people are, you know, being unhoused, but the solution is not to just criminalize it and move them over to the next neighborhood or whatever. The solution is to provide them with the housing and services so that they can, they can get housing, they can get, you know, they can get a job and they can get any services they need if they need mental health care, if they need job training, anything like that. They should get those services rather than us just criminalizing their presence and, you know, making it hard, hard even harder on them. Right. Thank you, caller. Caller with the number ending in 4415. Please press star 6 to unmute. Great job. Please state your name and the items on which you'd like to speak. Good evening, Sonia. I want to speak on general public comment and item number four. Thank you. Two minutes. Thank you. I am seeking to oppose item number four because criminalization will not end homelessness. People living on the street are my neighbors and yours. They're neighbors, not criminals, and deserve services, not sweeps. I believe that the proposed mandatory enforcement within 500 feet of schools and daycare centers will be detrimental to youth and adults experiencing homelessness. In addition, as a product of the LA public school system and an LGBTQ person, I know that homelessness disproportionately impacts queer students. Therefore, I oppose the motion. I am an Angelino who became a US citizen just last year. So I'm using my rights gained from naturalization to advocate for unhoused Angelinos because 41.18 breaks my heart. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Call with the number ending in 9702. Please press star six to unmute. Good morning, Chair members. This is Zeke Sandoval speaking on behalf of PATH, people assisting the homeless. I'm also a uh, LUSD graduate. I'm speaking on item four in general public comment. Great, you have two minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, broadening the scope and scale of enforcement like this only wastes valuable time and resources that would be better spent on outreach and housing. Service providers, elected officials, and Angelinos of every housing status agree the status quo is unacceptable. That's why, since the start of the pandemic, Los Angeles has conducted multiple intensive encampment-to-home efforts, demonstrating many times over that we can safely and sustainably resolve encampments 
when we invest in proper outreach and access to permanent housing. As participants in those more successful efforts, and as one of LA's largest service providers for decades, we reiterate that people begin their journey out of homelessness only when we meet them with trauma-informed outreach and adequate housing and services. The safety and well-being of everyone, housed and unhoused, is of the utmost importance. We remind the council that our unhoused neighbors are far more likely to be victims of violence than they are to be perpetrators. Enforcement of anti-camping ordinances then only displaces people and makes it harder for trained outreach staff to establish trust again. Residents of clear encampments, unless connected to stable permanent housing through a trauma-informed case management process, often return to unsheltered homelessness. We urge the council to pursue outreach and affordable housing development strategies we know to be successful and avoid rushed enforcement actions waiting, wasting valuable time and resources. As we have for decades, we pledge our firm partnership in the city's efforts to end homelessness through outreach, housing, and supportive services. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with the number ending 6700, please press star six to unmute. Great, please state your name and the item on which you'd like to speak. Hello, my name is Jorge Robles. I would like to speak on item number four, please, on public comment. Okay, you have two minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Los Angeles City Council. My name is Jorge Robles, and I am a parent and a employee at Thomas Star King Middle School in Council District 4. I am calling to support the amendment to the Los Angeles Municipal Code Section 56.11 and 41.18 which would expand to include all schools and daycare centers in the city. <clears throat> I believe this amendment would help students and staff feel safer on their daily route to school. At this point, the city has already provided many services and outreach programs to homeless individuals, which most refuse to take advantage of. This is not only a safety issue for students and staff, but also for the homeless individuals themselves. In my experience at Thomas Stark King Middle School, Staff and students and families have had to avoid homeless individuals which are publicly intoxicated, having mental breakdowns, uh, defecating on public property, public drug use, exposing themselves to students as they walk to and from school. Please, this would be very important if you, if you did uh, support the amendment to uh, 41.18, please. Thank you, caller. Caller with the number ending 272979. Please press star six to unmute. Hello, uh, yes. my, name, my name is Peggy Lee Kennedy uh, with the Venice Justice Committee. And I'd like to speak on um, general public comment and item four. Great, you have two minutes. So, uh, you know, I'm just wondering how much money the signs are going to cost on this because, and does the city even know how many daycares there are? It's, this is pretty big. I mean, these, the city is create, already creating massive no homeless zones, which are really inappropriate and harmful to the people that have to be dislocated. Because, you know, the fact is, is there aren't enough services for them. There isn't the permanent housing. There isn't even enough shelter. And you know what's really dangerous and scary? Being homeless. That's where the real danger is. The city and this council and this committee should be focusing on what it takes to house people, not protecting the people who are crying that have housing. We need to house people and protect them. They are the most vulnerable people we have. That's what this committee should be looking at. How about, you know, we look at all of these co 
road violators, these gigantic buildings and developments that happen in the city, or con illegally converted Airbnbs. You know, maybe we could find some of them. And I'm not talking the little mom and pop people that you guys catch and put liens against their property. I'm talking about the big violators. You know, let's go and do a study on how much money the city could make doing that, or, you know, what it takes to actually create housing for the people that are living by these schools, you know, because that's the real thing we need to do, not just move people around and harm them and target them with the police and then spend tons of money on these crazy signs. I mean, really, do, do you guys even know how Thank you, caller. Caller with the number ending 4080, please press star six to unmute. Hi, yes, my name is Anne. I'd like to speak on um, item number four and make a general public comment. Great, you have two minutes. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for all that you guys are due to um, address the homeless crisis. Um, first, we are a very compassionate city as citizens here, as you know, and want the homeless crisis resolved. We want to get people triaged. We want to get the help that they need, either to treatment centers or permanent supportive housing using the um, HHH and H funds and all the other funds that the taxpayers have already paid for already. But all of the callers um, opposing this amendment um, are, are significantly out to lunch. Protecting our children is of the utmost importance. They are minors. As far as I'm concerned, 500 feet is not even far enough. All of the same kind of things that the callers are saying in terms of how much are these signs going to cost, well, how much are the lives of our children worth to you? So please, 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 ensure the safe passage of our children to and from schools. How many lockdowns and incidents do we have to have? Like the Selma and the Hollywood High School were locked down several times. Men scaling the fences with knives. Being, um, walking through human feces and urine and having children exposed to drug deals and um, uh, people exposing themselves and be, uh, doing open drug use and all kinds of things. I would love for the people to get help in the way that they need it, um, but we have to protect our children. I also would love for you to include uh, that mobile encampments, such as RVs, campers, trailers, trucks, and cars, be included in this amendment. They have to be within 500 feet, like any other homeless encampment. So please include this. Um, and I just want to say that I strongly support this amendment and also um, in terms of uh, other homeless issues in Hollywood and Los Feliz, we're continuing to suffer from the proliferation. Thank you, caller. Caller with the number ending 7434, please press star 6 to unmute. Hey, my name is Stevie. Um, I live in Hollywood, actually right by Hollywood High. I'm with Street Watch and Services Not Sweets, and I'd like to speak on items four in general public comment. Great, you have two minutes. Yeah, so uh, criminalizing does not solve homelessness. It's amazing that we don't understand that yet, but how, how expensive would it be to enforce all these banishment zones? We already see $3 billion funneled into LAPD to try to enforce the 4118 laws that are already in sight or that are already have been passed. And as was mentioned previously, those signs cost $2 million. How many apartments could we get with $2 million? It's interesting to hear all the uproar over children's safety, but I've heard no mention of the 18,000 LAUSD students who experience homelessness. So what are we doing to protect their safety? And what is it that we're protecting our children from? We're hearing all of these extravagant stories. I've been working on the streets for two years. I have never had anyone expose themselves to me. I'm not denying anyone's experience. Uh, but we are trying to shield children from the sight of poverty, from the sight of the failures of capitalism. But we don't care about actually putting people into any of the three apartments that are available for every one unhoused person on our streets. We would rather funnel more money into the police to enforce what? That people shouldn't go to the bathroom? Because you don't have to 
up having to use the bathroom when you are poor. If we had public restrooms, maybe we wouldn't have to worry about these things. It's a shame on humanity that we continue to blame and outcast the people who are thrown away by the society, which is the elderly, people with disabilities, 40% black and brown folks, and we just have all these people protect the children. This is, criminalization does not solve homelessness. Children are homeless. People need houses. People need services. I yield my time. Thanks, caller. Caller with the number ending 7059, please press star 6 to unmute. Zachary Warmer calling on item number 4. Awesome. Um, you have one minute. Good morning, Council Members. Zachary Warma, Associate Director of Policy at LA Family Housing, calling in opposition to item number 4, the proposed ordinance extending LA Municipal Code 4118 to within 500 feet of schools and daycare centers. Youth homelessness in LA is a major crisis, one that disproportionately impacts LGBTQ plus youth and students of color. In 2020, 15,000 minors experienced homelessness in LA, while per the County Office of Education, there are over 51,000 students who are without a stable place to call home. Without any additional investments in the tools proven to end homelessness, the likeliest outcome of this ordinance will be the increased criminalization of unhoused families and students, many of whom live near the schools they continue to attend. Per the city's open data hub, there are over 1,000 LAUSD sites within the city limits, along with over 600 private schools and well over 100 daycare centers. Through this proposed ordinance, there will simply be more locations we lack the staff, services, and essentially the housing to properly support. It's for these reasons we urge you to reject this proposed ordinance. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Colin. Mr. Mr. Chair, I should say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, sir. Uh, let me raise my volume. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. That will conclude our public comments for today. Uh, thank you, everyone, who uh, called in. Committee members, as I mentioned uh, earlier, for item number two, I am recommending we adopt the recommendations into Proposition HHH Administrative Oversight Committee's report. Uh, do any members have any questions or comments regarding uh, this specific item? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Uh, Verano, Luigi, if you could be so kind enough to uh, call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Council Member Council De Leon. Uh, Council Member De Leon. Aye. Council Member Raman. Yes. Council Member Buscaino. Aye. Council Member Rodriguez. Council Member Rodriguez is absent. Council Member Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Four ayes, and this item is approved. Thank you very much. Uh, item passes on a 4 to 0 vote. Uh, I want to let the listening public know what we just approved. We just approved. 80 units, specifically 80 units uh, for uh, uh, permanent supportive housing in South LA uh, for Council Member Harris Dawson's district. And we also just approved 63 units of permanent supportive housing uh, in the Valley, uh, specifically for Council Member uh, Krikorian's uh, district. Now I'd like to move to uh, our next uh, three remaining agenda items. Uh, uh, Luigi, we're going to start with file item number four. I know the vast majority of folks who called in today called on the issue of four uh, for those for it and those who were against it. If you could be so kind of to please read it into the record. Item number four is a city attorney report and ordinance relative to amending section 41.18 of the Los Angeles Municipal Code to make it unlawful for a person to sit, lie, or sleep or to store, use, maintain, or place personal property near schools and daycare centers, and to amend section 56.11 of the LAMC to align it with section 41.18 and to remove references to bulky items. Thank you very much, uh, Luigi. I believe we have uh, Valerie, Valerie Flores uh, from the City Attorney's Office to give us a, a brief presentation. Valerie, are you with the uh, Yes, we are. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Cheers. Um, I will uh, briefly summarize the ordinance that's before you today. Basically, it does uh, three major things. First, it uh, will codify the request by the city council to ban encampments 
within um, 500 feet of all city schools and licensed daycare centers. Uh, second, it will remove references to bulky items pursuant to a court ruling. But please note that uh, the city will still be able to regulate bulky items in the public right of way so long as they treat them like all other items um, and don't distinguish uh, bulky items just because of their size. Um, third, um, the ordinance will align municipal code section 4118 and section 5611. Both ordinances deal with encampments, but section 4118 primarily deals with where the encampments um, can be lawfully in the city and where they um, may not be. And 5611 deals mainly with the city's rights regarding the ability to confiscate and store personal property above a certain limit um, and um, to keep property from blocking sidewalks um, or to um, uh, have hazardous materials on sidewalks. The ordinance before you today will align and harmonize those two ordinances because they do overlap in certain regards um, relating to the storage of property. Um, and um, also the enforcement provisions will be aligned so there's no conflict between the two. I'm happy to answer any specific questions you might have about the ordinance. Thank you very much, uh, Valerie, for the presentation or you know, the explanation. But uh, I know any time uh, the sign comes up, it's, it does spark a, a spirited debate. And I imagine uh, my colleagues here today uh, have questions or, or clarifications they, they may want to ask. Um, so we're gonna, uh, I'm going to facilitate the questions, commentaries uh, from my colleagues. But one, one question that I'd like to, to, to ask, is I have uh, feedback that comes to me from, from my, my field team and, and city agencies doing the work, uh, and it's regarding the radius circles uh, that we've adopted. Uh, most times, these radius circles, they seem to cut streets you know, in sidewalks right in half, uh, making where camping is prohibited, I think uh, very confusing. I think some of the callers who called in, those who in, in opposition uh, in particular, uh, actually I think bring up um, some, some valid points. Um, this may create some confusion. Uh, for example, a, a radius could cut a diagonal, uh, at a diagonal across a sidewalk, make it impossible for anyone to determine when the where the given 4118 zone actually is located. So the question I have, you know, Valerie, is to help clarify the zones throughout our communities for both schools as well as the daycare centers, along with locations uh, done by resolution. Would it be possible to amend this ordinance to have the zone? extend it to the end of the blocks that fall within the radius? Uh, yes, uh, Council Member De Leon. We could amend the ordinance such that all measurements under the ordinance are the greater of 500 feet or to the end of the block. So that would help clarify any confusion and sort of start out this bifurcation of a, 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 a city block where a school or, or daycare center may be at, which I think is is really important. So there's transparency among the city agencies and all the stakeholders involved uh, where there's no confusion. So what I'm going to do, my colleagues, is I'm going to make a recommendation with a small, the no, following small amendment. I move that we amend the draft ordinance in council file 201376-S1. Um, uh, again, 22-1376-S1 to change from the current radius to end as, uh, to read as the end of all blocks within the radius of the designated location. Second, I'll second that. Okay, we, I think we have a second that 
think if you miss it, looking through, they have the second right there. Uh, it's, let me see one again. It's 20. I just got a clarification. It is 20, not 22. It's 20 dash 1376 dash S in Sam 1. Uh, we have a second, uh, what, Mr. Blumenfield. Um, before we go to a, a, a vote, uh, colleagues, uh, if there's anyone who has any questions or comments, Mr. Blumenfield. Thank you. Um, for comments and clarifications and um, a little response to some of what I heard the callers call in. First, you know, I had some of the same concerns about the cost uh, of signs, and um, but I have, I've had a conversation with, with Valerie Flores about that. I just wanted to put that out on the record as far as because my concern, of course, is if we were actually paying for the signs that we paid for, for the 4118 sites, this would be exorbitant. But you explained to me that we do not have to do signs, and uh, I'd like you to explain that to me again, but really for the benefit of, of callers and other folks who might have the same concern. Uh, certainly, uh, Councilmember Bluenfield. Um, th so signs will not be necessary to enforce the no camping uh, ban around schools. Um, the reason is that all schools um, and all licensed daycare centers will be included. It's a conduct law. And in general, conduct laws do not need signage. Um, they, people are deemed to um, know uh, the law. Um, now, with regard to property, however, um, there will be a paper notice letting people know that um, if the property is not taken out of the zone, uh, it, it can be uh, confiscated and stored by the city. But with regard to the no encampments, no signage will be needed. The reason why signage was put up with regard to the current version of 4118 in specific sites is because not all schools were covered or not all daycares were covered under the current version of 4118. Only those specific schools and daycare centers that were moved by resolution um, by the city council to be covered actually were. So someone um, wouldn't know coming up to a school whether it was a school where encampments were um, allowed or not. But now that all schools and all daycare centers that are licensed will be um, off limits for camping um, around a certain radius, we will not need to put signage. I would just note, however, that there is already a lot of signage around schools. Um, most schools already, um, in addition to the signage on the school property itself, there are other uh, criminal laws where there are enhanced penalties around schools, like drug dealing or certain firearms offenses. And so um, many schools, or most of the schools, have signage up letting people know when they're entering into a school zone. Great. Uh, thank you. That, that's an important uh, explanation. I'm going to ask you one other explanation as well. But first, I just wanted to comment. Uh, you know, a lot of the callers called in and said this is not a solution to homelessness. Um, and I want to be on the record. I completely agree. This is not a solution for homelessness, and, and nobody going into this should think that it is. Um, well, just like some of the callers, the solutions are outreach, housing, supportive services, the kinds of things that we're doing in items one, two, and three, and that we are focusing most of our time on, which is, and money on, and resources on, which is providing housing and the services, that needs to be our North Star. Um, that being said, I do, you know, and I'm a, I'm, I'm a believer that everyone has a right to a roof over their head. I really do believe that. But that doesn't mean that you have a right to, to be anywhere in the public right-of-way. Uh, just as, you know, it's not criminalizing homeless folks by saying that you can't sleep on a school playground, you can't sleep in the school gymnasium. If we go a step further and say you can't sleep within 500 feet of a school, that doesn't criminalize a person. Um, it is just saying that there are certain rules and regulations that we as a society are setting up in terms of where encampments can be and can't be. Um, it does give me pause because this is a large a much greater amount but I wanted to get into this criminalization question because I also understand you know with 4118 you, you don't someone can't just ride up on you and say oh you're, you're having a cabinet there and write you a ticket right they have to give you an opportunity to um, 
to cure, to move on. Is that correct, Ms. Ferris? Um, no, as requested by the city council, um, a violation of 4118 can, in the first instance, uh, be uh, this, uh, a, a, a citation or an infraction, but it cannot be an arrest. Um, an arrest under 4118 could only happen if the person refuses to move to an area where encampments are permitted. All right, well, I mean, I want to say... But, but, uh, again, as a matter, I, I, I would just like to clarify that I believe that the LAPD PD is not writing tickets or infractions um, in the first instance. I think um, I, I, I think their first um, effort is always to try to get voluntary compliance. Because that's my understanding about how, you know, this is not, this, this larger scale doesn't allow us to do the screening engagement, certainly that we've been doing in my district, I know with the, with the limited, very limited 4118 sites, it is a different dynamic. Um, and a lot of schools don't have anyone in camp there now, period. And we're trying to avoid that from happening in the future. Um, but as we move as to implementation as a city, I want to make sure that we do, um, we, we push for a strategy whereby folks are, if someone is in, in, in violation of this ordinance, that the first things first, which is they're they're approached and they're asked to move somewhere else, and they're offered services, which is you know the goal here. Um, that being said, uh, I will turn it back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Bloomfield. Uh, Ms. Um Thank you so much, uh, and thank you for those questions, Councilmember Bloomfield, and for your comments earlier, Councilmember De Leon, and. Valerie for um, your responses. Um, I, you know, I think I really just wanted to speak about my concerns about this um, this expansion of 4118. I spoke about it already when we first discussed it in council, but I think it's important for me to just restate what those concerns are because I think they're important for us to consider, particularly in this committee where our job is really to make sure that we're trying to address homelessness here in the city of Los Angeles, the city's biggest crisis. I'm the parent of six-year-old twins. They just finished kindergarten at LAUSD school down my street. And I think about their safety all the time. I want them to be safe. I want every child in the city going to school anywhere in the city to be safe. This is a matter of deep, deep concern to me. And so if this was a vote about whether we can keep kids safe going to and from school realistically, uh, or whether the, if this was a vote about whether or not I want encampments near schools or not, then I think the answer would be very clear. But that's not really what this vote is about for me, or that's not what this amendment is about. The question for me is, how do we get to the outcome that we all share, which is how can we end homelessness in the city effectively, and how can we end homelessness particularly around schools and where children are going to be and how do we keep kids safe effectively. We really need to be as a city thinking about how we can make effective policy. And I really want to make sure that we're not misleading our constituents and continuing to make promises that the city simply can't deliver on. And I think we need to be working towards exactly these outcomes, keeping kids safe, keeping parks safe, keeping schools safe with real resources that can really lead to lasting change on our street. I want to just talk about, you know, two quick things here in this context. One is that we have about a year of experience already with 4118, with the version that we passed last year. Um, I think we have about 100 locations across the city where we've put the signs up. And, you know, as Council Member Bloomfield mentioned, the earlier version came with the street engagement strategy and additional resources. And even in those locations, I have seen, and the LA Times has documented this, a really, really mixed response coming out of those locations and the bans on camping in those locations. In some of those locations, LA Times reporters found that there were still tents right underneath the signs that said you can't camp here. In other locations, they found that tents had moved exactly 500 feet away from those posted signs. In some cases, moving them closer to homes, closer to parks, closer to other kinds of institutions where we people may have concerns about 
the location of encampments near those locations. And now despite the lack of success of that effort, we are now voting to add hundreds of new locations to that list. I think there's a, one caller mentioned that there's a thousand LAUSD schools and 600 private schools plus uh, you know an additional number of daycares that are going to be added to this list. If we are not able to implement this law, <laughs> even in the original hundred locations, I'm not sure what we're promising to people in these other hundreds of locations. Um, and I think that's that's a real problem. I think what we should be thinking about is how do we actually address homelessness around school locations where there are real concerns around encampments. One of the callers was from Thomas Dar King, which is a school in my own district. I know exactly the encampment that he is talking about because we get calls about it all the time. That encampment would not be impacted by this new expansion of the rules because it's further than 500 feet. So literally the, pers the, the challenge that this person is calling in about would not be addressed by this rule. <laughs> and even if it were covered by it, it is not clear to me given the ways in which the law has been impacted in the original 100 locations that this individual would have a resolution to the problem that is that that he's struggling with for his students in his school, um, and and for his own student, uh, for his own children as as they're attending LAUSD. I just think what I want to do in this in this committee, what I want to do in this council, what I want to do in my own district, <coughs> is really to figure out how do we make effective policy that gets us to the outcomes that we want. And the outcome that I want here is really to figure out how do we bring about an end to homelessness. When you have a situation that we have right now here in Los Angeles where we have scarce resources, we simply do not have the number of housing units, we don't have the number of outreach resources, we don't have the number of beds, we don't even have the number of people who are doing enforcement to do any of this work, right? So when you have a situation with scarce resources, I think the way you get to the outcomes that you want to go to is by prioritizing those scarce resources to locations where they're needed. And I think if we were really serious about saying we want to make sure that we're addressing encampments in and around schools, in and around parks, um, what we would be doing is taking our scarce resources and prioritizing them for those locations. That is a truly effective response to addressing homelessness in locations that we have the most concerns about. That's the kind of policy that I want to be making here. That's the kind of policy thinking that I think we should be doing here. Um, and, you know, I just... I continue to find this and you know a very frustrating conversation because that that is not what we're talking about today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Roman. Um, uh, Mr. Buscain. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Roman, I, I I agree with you that the frustrations of forty one eighteen and basically what you're saying is 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 making that argument for a citywide ban on camping. Of course, the shelters refused. Um, because and I'm, I'm okay with expanding the, um, the buffer zone from 500 to 1,000 feet to protect our, our students and families and faculty at our, at our schools. Members, over a year ago, almost a year ago, if you recall, um, I, I made an effort to uh, ban encampments next to all LAUSD schools. And you heard the passionate... Um, plea on the council floor then uh, when that motion that listed over a thousand schools got set to committee for further deliberation. And I said then we should not deliberate or debate when we are protecting our schools, our kids, our parents, and our faculty members. For those who feel like the encampments are safe um, that are abutting next to our schools are completely out of touch with reality. Here are my observations, members. Um, some of our schools in Harbor City, in Wilmington, in Watts, I've heard loud and clear from the principals, and thank you to the principals and faculty members who called in today. Uh, we, I, I've heard your pleas for, for years. I believe we're at, we're at a point now we're going to make some significant improvements to your school. What I saw 
is encampments. So you had uh, um, tents that are tied next to our playgrounds. You had open drug use that children were observing almost on a daily basis. You had clearly um, those suffering from mental illness, naked, running up and down the streets next to our schools. And I said then, who are we serving when we're allowing our kids, the most vulnerable among us, to observe what they were observing, causing more trauma in a time where our students are more traumatized than ever coming out of COVID? Who are we helping when we are, yes, allowing those suffering on our streets? Uh, who are we helping when a time where I was a senior lead officer we led a safe passage program years ago that our kids and parents were afraid to walk to a school due to gang violence. So coupled with that, we are doing what we promised on our safe passage, just making sure when students and, t and parents walk to campus, they are not forced to walk onto the street. They're not forced to tiptoe around feces in urine or tiptoe around needles that are used for drug use. This is long overdue, members. Long overdue. So I've learned from other members on the council when they say, we have two choices here. A yes vote will be supporting the pleas from our parents, supporting the plea from the superintendent a yes vote would support the pleas from our faculty members to ensure that the most sacred places among us, playgrounds and schools, are safe and free and clear of large dangerous encampments. A no vote will support the continued cause of fear among students, faculty and parents fear that they to walk to school because they have to step over an encampment. Um, a fear among dealing with those who are suffering from mental illness and fear among seeing and observing and witnessing open drug use next to our campuses. So for me, the choice is clear. And you ought to not be surprised based on where I'm coming from because I've called for this nearly a year ago, but we are here. So Mr. Chair, thank you for scheduling this, uh, our council president for moving on this. Four words, it's about damn time. Let's move on this and get this done and protect our students, our faculty and our parents. Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Buscaino. And I, I know that 41.18 in the amendment for the expansion for our schools as well as our um, daycare centers elicits a, a very spirited uh, conversation. And I think that's where lies the, the challenge and the conundrum. Um, to Ms. Raman's points, uh, which are, are, are thoughtful, and I understand completely where, I think we all understand completely where she's coming from, and to when reality sort of hits the rubber, hits the road, to the points that, that you're making, Mr. Buscani notes, like everyone is in agreement. Um, um, by far and large, this is a, a humanitarian crisis that we need to move forward. Um, and it's not just about our unhoused neighbors, it's also about housed neighbors, it's about children, it's about everybody, it's holistic. It's about all the stakeholders, not just some stakeholders. And that's where lies, without a doubt, the, the spirit of debate that, 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 and the thoughtful you know, conversation. And obviously the, the, the spirit of debate that, that takes place you know, uh, on our sidewalks and our streets uh, today. Um, it's interesting because just very quickly, um, I think I have enough anecdotal evidence to say with a sense of certainty, it suffices for empirical evidence that engaging with a lot of our unhoused neighbors who currently have a roof over their head, albeit 
interim, not permanent, in tiny homes, um, they're very happy and they're very thankful, in fact. Uh, uh, but if you get a, a perspective from a tiny fraction of uh, other individuals uh, who are not homeless, uh, but who quote unquote advocate for the homeless, um, the perspective is is that it's, it's carceral housing which is very insulting to like my constituents, you know, and, and I'm sure many other constituents who actually have spent time either in LA County Jail or San Quentin or Folsom or Pelican Bay or Corcoran. You know, people have actually spent real time, you know, uh, in a prison and, you know, are out of the system now and, and trying to, you know, get move forward with their lives. And that, that's what we've been collectively trying to disrupt the school to prison pipeline that has existed for a very long time, but to diminish and call it carceral housing and, and these policy laboratories, um, it just, it's nonsensical. At the same time, there'll be folks who, 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 who do oppose uh, this amendment um, as Ms. Rahman has, has articulated and, and very thoughtfully, you know, um, doing so. At the same time, we got to move fast forward with the production of the inventory in the stock and not letting the perfect in the way of, of, of the good um, and produce the, the permanent as well as the interim housing combination thereof so we can get all of these folks quickly off. It's, it's not an either or equation, it's a combination of all the above as we move forward to deal with this crisis. So um, I just thank everyone for their, their thoughtful conversation uh, across the board. Uh, if there's no other questions or commentaries uh, from the members, I am seeing none. Again, I want to thank you much for the conversation. Uh, Luigi, we have uh, the item that's before us as amended. Um, we have a second uh, by Mr. Blumenfield. Um, Luigi, if you could look high enough to please call the vote. Council Member De Leon. Aye. Council Member Rahman. No. Councilmember Buscaino. Yes. Councilmember Rodriguez. Councilmember Rodriguez is absent. Councilmember Blumenfield. Aye. Three ayes, one no, and this item is approved as amended. Thank you very much. You know, colleagues, we move forward with the one vote uh, to the floor of all of our colleagues as a whole to uh, opine on the issue that we just moved from committee. Uh, that being said, uh, we're going to move forward with our agenda. We just have a couple of items still left. Um, I want to maintain this quorum uh, as long as possible. Therefore, we're going to ask for brevity uh, among our folks who will be coming in. Uh, uh, I believe we have uh, uh, Marilee, if I'm correct. I hope I, I, I pronounce it correctly. If not, uh, please uh, correct me. Uh, we have Mary Lee from the CEO's office with assistance from Daniel from the LA Housing Department to give us a brief presentation. Yes, good morning, committee chair and members. Uh, Mary Lee Oriana Farias with the Office of the City Administrative Officer. Uh, the item before, um, item number one, the item before you is related to the Housing Departments and our offices. Mary Lee, yes. Let me just give an opportunity for Luigi to, to read this uh, uh, for the record. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank Item you. Number one is a City Administrative Officer Report and Los Angeles Housing Department Report and Resolutions relative to the State of California Department of Housing and Community Development Home Key Round 2 Program and Funding Sources for Home Key Round 3 and Related Matters. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Luigi. Merrily, I'm sorry for uh, that, that, that interruption. Uh, please uh, uh, go forward. No problem. Okay. Um, the recommendations in the CAO report dated um, June 17, 2022 are broken up into two categories. Uh, the first category is various actions or authorities needed to ensure that the housing department is able to close on the acquisition of 928 units under the state's Home Key 2 program by September 2022. Um, this includes reauthorizing the reserve fund loan that was approved in the current fiscal year for the Home Key 2 program um, for 22-23 authorizing the use of up to 50 million in prop hhh general obligation bond proceeds to serve as a revolving loan fund for a period of no more than 90 days 
um, to provide cash flow to close acquisitions of approved projects, approving up to $17.46 million uh, to resolve the remaining gap for Home Key Round 2, and also resolution authority for two positions in the Housing Department to support the Home Key Program commencing on July 1st, 2022. Um, the second category of recommendations is this office's response to Council's instruction to report back on the funding resources for the Home Key Round 3 local match, since it was expected that the state would issue a $1.3 billion notice of funding availability, or NOFA, for Home Key 3, um, and that the Housing Department would apply to acquire up to 700 units under that NOFA. Uh, the required city match to acquire up to 700 units is estimated to be $190 million. Um, so through through this report, the CAO requests that the council commit up to $130.5 million in funding, which is detailed in the CAO report, uh, which was identified by our office and the housing department to address the potential city match for Home Key 3. Uh, through this report, the funding will be reserved or set aside, but will not be encumbered or appropriated since the Home Key 3 NOFA amount is still unknown. But assuming that the NOFA could be up to 1.3 billion and that the city could potentially apply to acquire up to 700 units. And if the 130 million in this report is reserved, it still leaves a remaining potential gap of 59.5 million for home key round three. Uh, the report includes a recommendation directing our office with the assistance from the housing department to report back to this committee and council on the final city match required and any remaining gap once the final home key three NOFA has been determined. Uh, this com concludes my presentation, but our office and the housing department are available to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Marilee. Uh, Daniel, do you have anything to add to this? Um, thank you, council member, uh, for um, uh, giving me a chance to talk a little bit more about uh, uh, Project Home Key. Um, we support uh, Mary Lee's um, uh, report or the CEO's report. I wanted to also just take a moment uh, uh, to also give a status update on where we are with um, all our applications into the state, as well as um, uh, a, a quick update on the uh, PHK RFP. Uh, so really quickly, um, things are moving in the right direction. Of the nine projects that we've submitted to the state to have gotten awards, uh, the remaining seven uh, uh, applications have gotten uh, we made significant headway and do expect uh, to receive those uh, awards. Uh, in addition, we've also issued our RFP um, in which we've uh, we've gotten uh, applicants uh, um, many uh, a, a strong in, a relatively strong interest in uh, in uh, owners and operators uh, in. Um, in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, taking on these project home key sites. So um, as a brief update, both things are going extremely well. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. And I want to thank you and, and Mary Lee uh, for the presentation. I, I appreciate the, the work that your teams have been doing uh, with uh, home key. I think we all agree that a, a sidewalk is not a Global environments, uh, which is why as a city we have been aggressively moving um, to create as many interim beds as possible to get folks, you know, off the streets. And I think this is a an issue. Um, uh, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the other folks who call always in opposition of things should be actually calling on, on, on the proactive part, uh, which are the solutions and the recognition of. Uh, putting these deals together, which, which are not easy. And I know that through Home Key 1.0 uh, and through the CAO's office, um, we've been able to, let me see, we were able to purchase 15 hotels and hotels. I know two of them uh, were one of the first projects I did in El Sereno uh, to add 891 units of housing in the last year. So I'm glad with the Home Key 2.0, we're going to be able to add an additional 1,276 units. Uh, and in this report, uh, we'll also, I think at the top of my head, um, be adding another 700 units by this time next year. So if my numbers are correct, hopefully this will add about 286 
200, 2,000, I should say, 2,876 units of support of the housing, uh, which is on top of HHH. This is separate, you know, from, from HHH. So this shows that the interim beds that we just opened up uh, under the, the roadmap and the bridge home projects that, that when our government partners, uh, um, for those who are historically responsible for the housing solutions, it gives us the resources that we need to, to quickly uh, open up. But uh, obviously, we know we have to do things faster, you know, um, uh, to deal with the crisis that's before us. So, but nonetheless, I, I want to thank you guys for the work that you've done uh, for uh, uh, Home Key. I just have a, a question, which is the Sears office regarding Home Key 3.0 now. We're talking about 3.0. I see that we're using a set aside of $130 million for the program. Now I want to make sure uh, that we're only setting those dollars aside at this time and not encumbering them. So it's important that we're not going to encumber them. So I want to hear from you specifically if that's correct or incorrect. Um, hi, good morning. Uh, Yolanda Chavez with the CEO's office. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, that's correct. At this point, we're asking that this funding be reserved until we know exactly what the state is going to issue in terms of the NOFA, they were the state was uh, definitely oversubscribed on our home key two, and most of the two point seven five billion dollars that was their budget is actually going to be expended on home key two, and so they're requesting the state is requesting additional funding through the state budget. So we don't know what the results of that is going to be, but we wanted to at least start identifying the sources for the match so that as soon as the state announces what the amount of the NOF is going to be, whether it's 1.3 or maybe lower than that, that the housing department at least knows how much has been reserved for the match so they can start identifying properties, right? Because it's hard to for them to start that process if they don't know if they have at least an initial potential match for for properties they may identify. So again, this is just a reservation. As soon as we hear what the state's going to do, we will come back and report, and hopefully we'll be able to report by July. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Landa. Yolanda. Um, I just have one more question for housing department. That would be you, Daniel. Um, uh, when are you going to be reporting back uh, to this committee regarding the interim to permanent uh, possibility we spoke about earlier this year? Um, Council member, uh, in the February 7th report, um, just by way of background here, uh, we had identified uh, uh, 400 sites uh, through GSD, um, and uh, which we identified uh, about 260 were leased properties, 79 buildings were, um, uh, excuse me, uh, 79 of these listings were tied to uh, existing buildings and 57 parcels were vacant land. We also uh, continued down this path um, uh, and uh, were able to identify potentially nine suitable sites of the, the 400 um, and uh, contacted brokers and shared this list um, uh, uh, with, uh, with your office. Uh, we also took a moment to identify um, uh, a dozen brokers and uh, to look at potential vacant sites. Um, all to say, uh, uh, we've been uh, working in background uh, in uh, in hopes of actually submitting an application in uh, by May second, which was the deadline for Project Home Keep uh, 2.0. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the limitations, if I may. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, future potential applications. Uh, full stop, it is uh, tied to the feasibility issue around operating costs. Um, so whether it be project-based vouchers or uh, uh, operating commitments, um, we have to show to the state 15 years of uh, uh, sustainability. Uh, we have been working with the state on um, uh, taking advantage of uh, Project Home Key 3.0. Um, and working through the issues of tenant, the tenant mix, the eligibility, the, uh, the matching requirements, and the most important thing, which is operating costs. One thing I can share is that throughout the state, 
uh, all cities are having very similar issues. Um, and so I think it is um, being heard loud and, and clear. Uh, we have been uh, not just the department, but also uh, we've also uh, have worked with, excuse me, uh, we have not just worked uh, with HCD, but also the governor's office and making sure that um, our needs as a city are being heard. Um, again, uh, the state's NOPA is expected in uh, October and uh, or November of this year. Um, we will have to revisit our approach, uh, whether it be uh, uh, new construction, uh, which is what we did for 2.0, or uh, interim housing in 1.0. Uh, but regardless, we, we have to wait for these um, regulations to roll out uh, to, uh, to figure out what our, our acquisition strategy is going to look like. Thank you, Daniel. I'm going to look forward to that report. There's something you said that, you know, I don't, I don't want to belabor the issue. I'm not necessarily in, in, in concurrence with you or your assessment uh, with regards to the 15 years of guaranteed stream of revenue for operating costs, uh, because you can't let the perfect get in the way the good. Um, nonetheless, I do uh, look forward to that presentation that you'll give um, in August or September. Um, I think it's really critical because I think to Ms. Rahman's point earlier today, when we're successful in setting up the interim uh, 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 non congregate shelters, whether it be tiny homes or uh, uh, home key, uh, room key, um, on the back end, we need that supply uh, to move folks out uh, into the permanent site. And if we can't move them out, there's a juggernaut there. We got that's it's almost like that supply chain right and we need everything working flow and i know we had challenges that are before us the inflation the cost of materials and so forth and, and labor these are a bunch of factors are, are playing itself out right now um but um we need it as, as fluid as possible you know this the supply chain that's working getting folks off the street interim we don't want them just staying there for years on end we want to get them out of the, the interim and move them into the permanent, you know, so we have a nice flow, you know, uh, and, and, and to the best of our ability to stabilize folks as, as best we can. Nonetheless, I'll just leave it there. Uh, I look forward, you know, Daniel, to um, uh, that presentation uh, in, in, in a couple of months, make it as, as detailed as possible so all the community members here can sort of kind of uh, just dissect it and, 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 and make comments or questions, you know, the probing questions that are. That are important so we can move forward and create as much as stock as possible. So I want to thank you very much, uh, Daniel, as well as Yolanda, as well as Mary Lee. I don't see any questions or comments from my colleagues right now. So, uh, Luigi, if you could be so kind enough to please call the roll. Council Member DeLeon. Aye. Council Member Rahman. Yes. Council Member Buscaino. Yes. Council Member Rodriguez. Council Member Rodriguez is absent. Council Member Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Four eyes, and this item is approved. Thank you very much, colleagues. We have the last final uh, item that's before us. That's final item um, number three. Uh, Luigi, if you could be so kind to please read it uh, into the record. Item number three is a community investment for families department report relative to a proposed strategic action plan for ending family and childhood poverty in the city by 2035. Thank you, Luigi. Um, I believe we have Abigail uh, Marquez, who's our general manager. Uh, for the community investment to families, uh, for families department for a brief uh, presentation on the item. Abigail, este bienvenida. Welcome. Thank you, council member. And I'm just going to say every time you say my name in Spanish, I remember my grandmother yelling at me, you know, across the, the kitchen. So it, that's the grin that you see every time you say my name in Spanish. But I'm just really delighted uh, to be you here. You're throwing a chunk left across <laughs> I will spare you the details, but I, I definitely think of my grandmother, um, who is, may she rest in peace. But I um, want to just really quickly introduce my colleagues who are with me this morning, um, and just want to thank you for allowing us uh, to present before this committee. I am joined this morning by Veronica McDonald, our Assistant General Manager, who oversees the Consolidated Planning and Program Operations Division for CIFD, and Ruth Rodriguez, our Executive Officer. And again, we want to thank 
thank you for this opportunity to present our proposed framework that, that seeks to continue to work with all of you and many others to alleviate poverty in the city. This report before you begins to outline our initial findings, recommendations, and proposes a coordinated effort across multiple city departments and jurisdictions. Next slide, please. Um, and if we can actually put up the, um, the PowerPoint presentation. Next slide. Yes, thank you. You are all keenly aware of the staggering poverty related statistics um, that have limited our city's reach uh, or, or limited our city's ability to reach its full potential and create economic opportunities for all Angelinos, regardless of their zip code or the neighborhood where they reside. However, for context, our report further illustrates the reality for so many households across the city. When we have 16% of Angelinos who live below the federal poverty level before, and that really represents 650,000 people who earn less than $23,000 a year for a family of three. For further context, this number is greater. This number of 650,000 people is greater than the entire population of Long Beach, Sacramento, and Oakland. Just wanna give um, that context for all of you as well. We know, um, again, I know that you know these statistics very well. You see it every day in your districts and communities across the city. But we also know that poverty is impacting black and Latino Angelinos the greatest. Next slide. CIFD is eager to join the fight to end poverty in our city. Through this work, we want to aggressively dismantle the pervasive cycle of poverty impacting so many Angelinos. Our goal is to have this work complement the policies adopted by the City Council and to continue to work with city departments implementing the programmatic aspects of those policies. We all can play an active role in alleviating poverty in the city. When Angelinos living in poverty cannot meet their basic needs, we have one in three adults in poverty that are working full time. Um, these are the challenges of the working poor. They're living check to check. They don't have a savings to weather a financial shock. They're severely rent burdened. Renters are severely bur rent burdened. They don't, uh, are not able to afford childcare and childcare in some cases it even, is not even accessible. And when we're talking about poverty, this represents 31% of our children in our city. Um, and it's compounded by so many other challenges. And it just further pushes Angelinos into a greater state of financial instability, housing insecurity, and ultimately homelessness. Next slide. We appreciate the vision of this council led by Council President Martinez and the mayor uh, to create the Community Investment for Families Department. We play an important role in advocating for families and lifting up the voices of the working poor. We are laser focused on fully leveraging our federal funds to make the greatest impact in low income communities across the city and working with all of you to create greater economic security for Angelinos. This work will, is directly aligned with our vision, our mission and the values of our department, which is to break the cycle of generational poverty by building community wealth. I am now going to turn it over to my colleague, Veronica McDonald, to walk us through some of the uh, next slides, and then I'll come back at the end. Thank you, Abigail. And you know, what's st staggering about the statistics Abigail was sharing is that poverty, like wealth, is passed on or passed down from generation to generation. So to fulfill our mission of breaking the cycle of generational poverty, CIFD uses a two-generational approach to break the cycle of poverty by integrating services, supports, um, to really move the family, um, well, and it's the whole family uh, forward. And we do this by intentionally and simultaneously working with children and their parents to access resources, solve problems, and sharpen existing skills through six key components you see illustrated in this diagram. The first is investing in early childhood development. Studies show that investments in high quality early education programs like child care and Head Start yield a 13% uh, per year return on investment based on increased increased school and career achievement as well as reduced social costs. Um, two, safe 
and accessible education that promotes a college-going culture, a person with a college degree will earn an additional $1 million over their lifetime. And for parents who complete a college degree, studies show their income doubles. This is important because at a parent's level of educational attainment is also a strong predictor of a child's success. Three, building economic assets. Financial stability, we all know, is critical to a family's economic and social mobility. Access to economic assets, such as housing, financial education and asset building, tax credits and student uh, financial aid, can help families generate income, increase the amount they can save, and create generational wealth. And then four, uh, strong work supports. Workforce development programs help families develop their skills to earn an increased household, to help them increase their household income and can have a positive impact on the life of a child. A $3,000 difference in a parent's income when their child is young is associated with a 17% increase in a child's future earnings. Five, access to health and well-being. If a child is unwell, it can affect attendance and learning in school. Similarly, a parent's illness can impact the ability to earn and perform at work. And then six, meeting basic needs. When families are able to meet basic needs like food, housing, and wraparound support, families experience less stress, which allows them to provide critical support that their children need to grow into healthy and productive adults. And it's through this family-centered lens that we integrate and align programs so that we can maximize long-term impact and create a legacy of educational success and economic prosperity that really passes down from one generation to the next. Next slide. Um, these six components that I covered are provided through a continuum of care that we provide at CIFD. And our programs that we have developed address three main areas. It's crisis, maintaining stability, and working towards economic resilience. As illustrated in this table, our prevention programs help families address their crisis by providing emergency and transitional shelter for survivors of domestic violence and human trafficking, homeless families with school-aged children that are temporarily living in motels, and families at imminent risk of homelessness through our Kids First and Solid Ground programs. Um, once the crisis is stabilized, families transition to our programs um, that really empower economic security, like our Family Source Centers and Teen Parent uh, Prosper programs that provide subsidized employment for teens, uh, coupled with academic and wraparound support to increase family income and high school graduation. And then following our family stability services are our programs that focus on building economic resilience through community wealth. So our programs like Big Leap, Free Tax Prep LA, our Children's Savings Account Program, Opportunity LA, and Financial Coaching. Next slide. Now, to end family and child poverty in Los Angeles, we have started to work with other city departments um, to identify our collective poverty alleviation efforts and have grouped them into three categories. Um, crisis, stability, and thriving. Um, we're analyzing our existing poverty alleviation programs and we will see some of these efforts um, and these other programs that you see listed here, um, like our emergency fund and problem solving. Uh, next slide. As we continue uh, to work as we continue to work through our analysis as a city, we need to reframe how we define poverty that considers the cost of living in LA, unique issues that Angelinos face. And so to illustrate that, you can see that it, to meet poverty in LA, um, a family would need to earn $70,000 in contrast to the federal poverty of 21,000. And so this is why we're, we're, we want to reframe it and really define poverty uh, in a more coordinated effort. Next slide. And as part of the reframing, we, we do want to coordinate with um, the city, not only with us and LAUSD and the state uh, and county, but uh, working together to help families and uh, really move this needle forward. Next slide. And so I will turn it over to Abigail to share over some of the, our next steps. Um, on our poverty alleviation report. 
Thank you, Monica. And I will go quickly through these uh, next steps. Some of these um, recommendations here have already been initiated. We've already established a working group that includes a number of city departments um, to begin to identify the programs and initiatives currently in place that are focused on alleviating poverty and supporting families and uh, communities across our city. And so we will build on that work in the months ahead. Um, we are currently partnering with uh, the University of Southern California to work with us um, to uh, help us with uh, research-based, uh, evidence-based pra best practices that um, have that are currently in place that we can scale uh, initiatives that are currently uh, being implemented that are scalable um, that can make a significant impact in communities across our city. And we will also be involved, and we already have been involved, in a number of uh, cross-regional uh, conversations with uh, our colleagues at the county. The County Board of Supervisors has identified poverty alleviation as a county board priority. We're working closely with county CEO's office as they develop their strategic plan that will be aligned with our plan. Conversations with the uh, school district. The school district, our new superintendent, has a new strategic plan um, that is really focused on a number of areas areas where uh, we directly intersect, and then of course our colleagues at the state on a number of fronts, not just as a recipient of some of our state, federal, uh, state community services block grant funding, but also in our work that we've been leading related to our guaranteed basic income program and really looking at how public benefits really don't complement each other, they actually work against each other in many ways. So we're tackling that policy area as well. We will also be holding a poverty summit in the fall of this year in October. We hosted the very first poverty summit in October of 2019 and we uh, intend to have another summit again. Where we will bring our leaders, our system leaders from across the school district, the county, the community college district, of course our city, to begin to, again, continue these conversations and make real commitments to alleviate poverty, not just in the city, but in the region. And the last um, is that we intend to, we're proposing to integrate this work in our upcoming five-year plan. So every five years, we do submit a plan to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and those policies and strategies are adopted. And so what we want to do is we want to be very intentional about our city's interest and commitment to alleviate poverty. So I will end there, council member, I'll turn it back over to you in case there's any questions and we rush through it because I, I know that we're already at the tail end of the, of the meeting. No, no, thank you very much, uh, Abigail, as well as, as, as Veronica um, and uh, for your presentation. I know it was a, a, a bit rushed and we, we apologize for all of that. We just don't want to, to lose quorum, but just very quickly, any list recommendations too. And, and perhaps maybe you guys can come back and, and, and we can have a do a little more comprehensive. I think most definitely you should be making this presentation to the full body as well too. But I would highly, highly recommend that you, I saw one of the bullets where you said you want all the, uh, uh, convene all the departments to deal with the issue of poverty. We gotta go beyond that. And the reason why I say that is I think you have to include planning department as well too. The reason why I say planning department you know, I think we have a culture that's stuck over there that believes that inclusionary, you know, zoning uh, is not, you know, uh, a step proactive step forward. So we're dealing with the issue of housing, we're dealing with the issue of poverty, you know, and if you don't have a roof over your head, then you're homeless or you're unhoused, whichever one uh, word that folks want to use. And that plays a huge, huge, huge role, you know, uh, in the city of LA, but you know, sometimes again, I want to go back. Some folks work in policy laboratories where the reality is so starkly different than what uh, what what they think is is real and what works, and you know what reality is in the streets of LA. So I, I would you know just include you know, the, the planning department because you know largely look at the mess we're in. We, we have to build four hundred four hundred fifty six thousand units in the next eight years. Half of them have to be affordable very low income, low income, middle income. We have 41,000 people living on our streets today. COVID hit, and we know that the very next wave tsunami could very well be folks who we would not characterize as unhoused, you know, people, there's folks from our community, you know, 
folks from El Sereno, folks from Ball Heights, folks from, you know, other areas who are historically have not been, you know, prone to mental issues and, and uh, work two, three jobs. You know, that person who sells oranges and tamales, you now the folks who get upset about ambulantes, you know, on the street, well, hell, they're working. They're, they're making a living. Uh, those are poverty wages, but they're making a living. And after that, they're going to be a janitor, you know, or a nanny or, to, you know, clean someone's house, you know. And, and my concern is, I think, it may sound odd, right? But I think planning has to be there. Planning is in yeah. the planning. No, I think you're you're spot on, council member. And I just will add that the planning department has already been involved, and so we convened already a working group that includes general managers. We also included our housing authority, and they've all been very receptive. Um, this initial meeting included either general managers, assistant general managers, or senior level members of these different departments. And I share your priority and commitment this is something that should involve all city departments and we should really be looking at the work that we're currently doing and what else should we be doing to improve the the um you know economic opportunities for every resident across our city and so, all yeah, the work that we do yeah and i like that because for example la sands we have we, we have jobs coming up. uh la fire department with regards to what can we do about local hires creating those pipelines from you know, uh, economically disadvantaged communities that creates a pipeline into the middle class. Now I have a defined benefit pension plan. Now I have a health care plan. And now I have a pathway into the middle class. Uh, perhaps I didn't go on to a four-year university. You know, me, you know, Kevin DeLeon, I graduated with a skin in my teeth, you know, you know, both in high school and, and I got kicked out of college, you know, um, for, you know, obviously, you know, not <laughs> great, not good uh, academic rates, but I had people who believed in me and who, who gave me a second, third, fourth chance. But I think that's why we have to involve everybody, not just because what I see a lot, when I see it, I've seen this a lot, is the, the organizations that advocate, you know, uh, poverty organizations, they're all within their own inner circle. And they're, they just kind of go in their little subculture, you know, subset universe. And ultimately, at the end of the day, it's the same reports, it's the same this, it's the same that, it's the same PowerPoint presentation, and they barely move the, 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 the needle, you know, and it, it's, it's seismic economic issues that we have to deal with, but it's the housing, it's uh, economic employability in creating, you know, local, and saying, why not local hires? And therefore, as a result of local hires, you know, we create that pipeline from East LA to, to MacArthur Park to Pacoima, you know, South LA and elsewhere into middle-class jobs, like where we say, with LA Sands and because of legal dumping throughout the whole city, it's actually economic opportunity, you know, to get into a good city job where we have the budget and we just gotta make sure we're hiring local hires, which means also too within the personnel department, for example, I you know it's, it's I'm going all over the place in this one, but you know, we just found out that they have this this uh, written, you know, uh, 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 test that's a very high level, which a lot of folks are not passing you know, which is nonsensical, but that's when the, the, the different departments are not working with each other. And I don't, you know, so it's, to me, it's a little nonsensical, but I really appreciate you and, 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 and Veronica. I don't know if there's any comments or commentaries from anyone else. I'm seeing that. Luigi, if you could be so kind of to please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Member De Leon. Aye. Council Member Raman. Yes. Council Member Buscaino. Yes. Councilmember Rodriguez. Councilmember Rodriguez is absent. Councilmember Blumenfield. Councilmember Blumenfield is absent. Three ayes, and this item is approved. Thank you very much uh, to, to all, Ms. Rahman, Ms. Buscaino, uh, 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 Luigi, as well as Gita. Thank you very much. I don't think we have anything on the desk, so this, uh, uh, do we have anything? Uh, the desk is clear, Mr. Chair. Uh, this month, uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, you guys, 